we're on. All right. Well, I want to say hello, everybody, but currently we have only one person here, one of the uh, speakers uh, with us. And I, I had the privilege to talk to him, actually, um, two weeks ago about this, um, this session, which is the new economic growth model for the U.S., given what we suffer through, uh, through COVID. What is this new agenda for America's economic growth? Well, 15 days have passed since that day in a garage, and we're looking at a very different uh, reality, very different perspective that you and I probably thought could happen, but probably also gave it not too much of a probability at that time to the extent that we've, uh, we've seen. So the topic is uh, the post-COVID shock, and the definition of that topic really is, uh, is it goes beyond COVID with, with what happened in the Ukraine. Um, again, Frank wanted us to touch upon the current budgets of the U.S. and the global partners, how it's going to be under stress in years to come, which it will happen, uh, especially with this trigger as well that we're seeing. And it will create difficult environments uh, for economic growth in these countries. Now, the question is, what is the policy? What should the policy be like? And I wanted to talk about monetary versus fiscal. I want to talk about mistakes that European Union has done, focusing on austerity at a time when they needed to grow. I want to talk about all of these economics uh, or new economics model. I want to talk about something called shared prosperity in going towards the future, um, creating this economic growth for um, more than the main players. That was my long-term economic growth vision. And that's what I want to chat today. However, <laughs> with what has happened, I think we need to introduce the elephant in the room. That is uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, how that's going to change uh, the things that we were hoping to talk about today. Long term growth um, possibilities, the scenarios, the policies that Washington has been planning under the Biden administration. And um, I'm going to pass it on to uh, my esteemed colleague, Nagarash Kumar, who's the managing partner of Devi in, in the U.S., and like I said, uh, we talked about the topic, uh, Nagaraj, your topic, original topic, but boy, I don't know how you're going <laughs> to approach this now, but the, um, the mic is with you now. Thank you. Uh, first of all, our hearts and prayers are with the Ukrainian people. Their bravery is unmatched. Uh, really, you know, command their, the, the President Yurovsky, how he is standing against the Russian innovation, uh, you know, the invades, how, you know, it's heartbreaking. It's, it's, it's very sad what we are seeing. Um, from the economic point of view, um, it's going to be a big challenge, uh, as we are seeing in the U.S., even though our topic is the future of the economic growth uh, on the pandemic. Uh, I just wanted to touch base a few minutes about what the current uh, uh, market scenario or the consumer confidence in the U.S. market. <clears throat> um, uh, as of uh, yesterday, when, when we were talking about the, the New York Federal Reserve President and CEO, John Williams, uh, inflation is still on the horizon. The prices are going up. When you see the gas prices, whether it's in New York City or in the California, uh, it's almost like a $5 to $6 compared to last year. Uh, so there's a huge uh, price increase in the oil uh, and, and that impacts the entire uh, supply chain issues, uh, your day-to-day -day activities going up. So the inflation will definitely be on the horizon. <clears throat> um, last two, three days back when President Biden in the State of the Union address uh, did not touch up on the economy, but uh, he, he mentioned that it is under control. Uh, so we'll take that, you know, the word from the president saying that uh, they, the administration uh, and his economic advisors will definitely go to take the active measures to overcome the inflation. So uh, that, that's a positive sign from the administration point of view. But coming to the ground reality, uh, it's been literally two years being in the COVID. <clears throat> the world has shut down. And uh, what has done from the employment, uh, uh, unemployment uh, was almost like a 10 to 13 percent. Uh, as of uh, today's numbers, actually the numbers are improved and uh, 
there's a 2022, the first quarter, uh, the, the fourth quarter of 2021, the first quarter, the unemployment rate has drastically reduced. There's a huge growth. Uh, and and uh, the U.S. economy, uh, the GDP has grown up uh, almost at 21 to $22 trillion compared to uh, what was there on um, 2020 before the COVID. <laughs> and so the economic impact of the COVID was widespread across the globe, so it impacted globally. Uh, but the current scenario with the, the Russian um, invades Ukraine um, is is actually trickling down on the global economy again. So the gas price or increase, the oil production is going to, uh, the OPEC has to either increase or decrease the oil production. Uh, and uh, the President Biden uh, actually mentioned that he's going to release those oil reserves, almost 60 to 30 million dollars, 30 million barrels, uh, which ease out the stress on these uh, gas stations across. <clears throat> But is it sufficient enough? So how long are we going to continue doing it? Uh, what is the long-term impact on this uh, current scenario uh, is, is what, uh, you know, especially the airlines industry is one which is uh, badly impacted because the passengers and also the cruise ships, now that we have a uh, number of uh, European countries uh, have restrictions on the airspace to the, the NATO region. So that also impacts uh, the, 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 the number of hours that take the international flight may take longer. Uh, for example, if it is taking 14 hours to India, it has to go through uh, the Kazakhstan and the Russia, and, uh, and now it may en route to a different, uh, the, the, the Pacific or some other air road, which takes around three to four additional hours of flying time. Uh, so that increases the cost. Uh, so it, it, it's it's a it's a human error at the same time uh, I'm sure every country is is going to face this for at least uh, uh, at least this particular quarter we're going to see a down um, downside of the economy um, so I'll stop there and um, we will continue on um, uh, the European as well as the Euro, uh, US uh, uh, models. Yeah, so one of our panelists uh, is having difficulty uh, joining in, uh, so hopefully he'll be with us soon. But I want to continue the conversation in the meantime. I want to sure. talk about um, the, uh, the Iranian role here. I've been hearing for the past couple of days in financial news channels, especially talking about Iranian oil coming into the markets. Um, what do you think uh, the Iranian role should be or what it is? That um, that it has been, you know, Biden administration, right? Sanctions continued, even though we talked about, um, you know, going back to the negotiating table. Uh, do you think that this crisis is going to escalate, escalate that, uh, getting the Iranians to the table and maybe their oil into the market? Um, see, again, it's the policy of the administration. How long the the this current crisis with the with the uh, Ukraine and Russia continues to drag into, uh, and how f how fast the I mean because the NATO and the US said they will not going to be uh, having the boots on ground so that is for clear yeah. so they're going to provide only the animation and helps the Ukrainian uh, community to fight uh, but is it enough for to protect their the nation so if if <clears throat> Um, if we are not going to enforce the, the air restrictions for the Russian Air Force, uh, how far, you know, how long the Ukrainian can sustain and protect their nation? It may be weeks, uh, but giving the all, you know, the scenarios, the worst case scenario, it may be the weeks once the Russian army enters into the Kiev, uh, the Ukrainian uh, capital. Once it is, they enter, then it's a worst case scenario. <clears throat> So the, yeah. world, the world leaders is ready to accept that. Or before that, we will have uh, coming to the negotiating table to draw the line. Uh, and at what cost? Uh, by the time the, the entire the economy will be collapsed. And we need to understand the long-term scenario, why the NATO uh, is not participating actually. I think the world understands that because they heavily depended on the Russian natural gas. Uh, yeah. If they wanted to uh, put the lights on in the winter, they need the Russian 
natural gas. Uh, so that's that's not a denying factor. So it's been happening for decades. Uh, yeah. if, if the if the NATO enters into a, a direct war path to the Russia, uh, then it will be a World War III. That's what you know. Majority of the the U.S. administration and the policymakers, uh, the previous administrations from the the Afghan War and the Iran Iraq War, uh, everybody understand that the challenge here uh, entering directly in conflict with Russia. Yeah. Uh, so, but the consumer. Um, the dependency of the oil is widespread. We don't have the alternative renewable energy source system fully in place. And we also have um, uh, established those ESG frameworks and, and uh, started establishing the, the timelines for the ESG to meet everybody net zero by 2030, 2040, and 2050. Uh, and and uh, the oil companies are obviously is badly impacted across the U.S. and the, uh, and, and the Europe. Uh, one good thing what I saw is the BP and other companies uh, where they have um, literally stopped their contracts or entering into the Russian oil industry. Uh, so maybe that's a good thing. It also impacts uh, the entire oil uh, inflow imports into the U.S. and the Europe. So where is yeah. the Can you fill the gap? Uh, then we are looking for the OPEC to literally pump their more oil to meet the demand. Uh, will the OPEC is ready for that? Uh, yeah, that's another way, question, right? Yeah. So to meet the demand, uh, the OPEC countries has to uh, increase their production. And the U.S. has to work with the OPEC countries, even though they may be not in a in a in a in a normal business communications, but maybe adversity countries. Uh, U.S. administration has to because you are closing one door, you can't have the luxury to close the other door too. Right. Uh, and let me ask you this: I mean, in, in our field, risk analysis, right? Uh, there's a famous saying where you know, if those who claim that they have the crystal ball will right. someday be, uh, you know, condemned to eat shattered glass. But I'm going to go ahead and ask you uh, what you see or, or a couple of scenarios where you see the oil price uh, in the six month period to even in the long term, because we already have uh, inflation that we're we're concerned with, not only in the U.S., in Europe, all of these supply chain problems that we talked about. Now comes this this serious uh, trigger for inflation. So where do you where do you see oil going here? And I want to welcome uh, Peter Alvin too um, to the room uh, and Sandeep Narwani. Uh, thank you for coming in. We're having some connection problems, but um, we're having a very, uh, very, uh, what's the word, liberal uh, way of doing this because we have only one panelist and one chair. So please, if you have any questions or comments that you'd like to, to make, we've been talking about obviously the elephant in the room, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. We're talking about inflation and how those two things are going to have an impact on the new economic growth model. With that being said, um, uh, Nagaraj, please take take uh, take yeah, over sure. with the oil prices. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome both of the other two panelists. Glad to be here. Uh, the oil, as of today, when you look at the U.S. Uh, the barrel, probably it hits one hundred and sixty dollars. That's what I saw this morning in the news. Uh, and, and in fact, yesterday when the news was the the, U, the European largest uh, the, the atomic uh, the, the what do you call the energy supply uh, it comes from the the Ukrainian uh, it was bombed by the Russians but luckily it was missed uh, and otherwise it would have been another catastrophe like it was in the Chernobyl. Uh, so, if if the worst case scenario, if if the U.S. if the Europe is depend upon uh, at least ten to fifteen percent of that nuclear um, energy supply, then if that that collapses, uh, then it would have been a disastrous. Then probably the gas price might have been gone to one thirty, one forty. Okay. But luckily, it did not happen. But as the if if we continue to 
have this uh, Ukrainian crisis escalates further and the Russia invasion into the Ukraine capital by next week, uh, the oil prices may go up to $140 to $150 for so gas. And that is uh, cat- catastrophic for the inflation it, it, uh, projections. It will, and it will add up to, you know, the, the basic commodities, including your bread, your milk, your, your entire supply chain. Uh, and and what is what I, we saw just now in a few minutes back in the news, in California, um, people are actually stealing the gas from the vehicle tanks, uh, putting a holes to it. Uh, so... How do you stop the crime like that? Yeah. So that, see, things escalates out of your control as you see the gas prices uh, go up to $7 to $8. Uh, can we meet the demand? Because that's, I think, is going to be a worst case scenario. Maybe we'll see $10 on the gas stations. Uh, that's uh, that is a disaster scenario. Uh, and yes, I could also see that happening, which, by the way, one of the... One of the arguments that I'm hearing is because of this inflation. Sandy, by the way, if you have any comments, please just jump in um, uh, to the to the discussion. But what I'm seeing is uh, this inflationary period is going to have an impact on demand and is going to uh, curtail it. And it is going to create a, um, a stagflation situation in the United States, which at a time when we were ready to get rid of COVID and just go out there, spend and do all of those things to get the economy going is a, is a terrible, terrible um, exogenous factor, really, uh, by this enhanced well, the inflation. The thing is, we actually close, literally closing one door from pandemic to epidemic. Uh, today, in, in the afternoon news, the New York the mayor declared that you don't need any masks. That means we are, we are easing out from the pandemic we are moving past and life becomes normal as usual before the pandemic. But cautiously optimistic, we continue to wear the mask and, you know, in the public gatherings. Uh, having said that, we just closing one uh, issue, then we open a much bigger issue. Uh, but this continues to all that inflation stream. Uh, and how much is the central banks is going to come to rescue the economy? Uh, how much, you know, it's it's a it's much bigger because th- this is the policy making. It's not the central banks how much money they can they can pump into financial institutions to stabilize the market. Uh, yeah, across the yeah. commodities, uh, this, ha- this will have an impact, and it is a long term impact. So it may be one quarter, two quarters, uh, as we you know as the day progresses, as the news comes in, live <clears throat> feed. Then maybe things completely changes. Well, let me. I mean, you made a great point about Federal Reserve here because, especially with the markets, right? It always remember right, reminded me of this baby analogy. You know, whenever the financial markets cried, Federal Reserve fed them. Whenever you know things went south, Fed changed them. Sure. And you know, the baby is is, is now. At, what is a 13 year old boy girl and still asking for a pacifier from the federal reserve however i don't think they have the room anymore which if the ukraine uh, invasion had not happened i was going to open with that as part of this new economic growth model it cannot be solely monetary decision makers anymore fiscal policy targeted fiscal policy social fiscal policy shared prosperity however you want to you want to label it will need to come in at some point and continue the growth process or uh, maybe share the burden with the Federal Reserve. But do you think Federal Reserve or ECB or other uh, monetary um, decision makers can do something in this situation with the inflation rates? Are so, to me, the only way the, inflation, uh, the interest rate is going to go is up, whether we're in recession or not. So what can they do, Nagaraj? I, again, two weeks back, if if had the Ukraine issue was not there, then the writing on the walls was very clear that the Fed is going to increase the rates. Well, fifty percent, uh, maybe seventy-five percent. I was hearing right. Exactly. So yeah. by first week of March, or maybe first week of uh, the first quarter of the April, beginning of the April, uh, we probably 
started having those signals already being sent out saying that the Fed is ready uh, to to increase the interest rate by 0.25% base points or 0.5. But it's going to be uh, a, a series of uh, interest rate increases in the next 12 months, at least five or six months. That, that was the expectations. Yeah. Every economy that we heard, we talked and we listened uh, because we are, we are almost... Uh, closing the pandemic because the death rate has been reduced, the hospitalization has been reduced. Um, then there's a uh, the, the vaccinations are freely available. Uh, people are accepted the vaccination for the third dose, and and, and the entire you know the the, the hospitality industry and the uh, the educating about the pandemic has been successful. So let it put that way. <clears throat> So it took two years, obviously, we, we lost almost a million people in the US itself and across the globe, uh, but it took time to overcome that. Uh, so the, the Fed, both from the ECB, the, the Federal Reserve, uh, and, and the rest of the global central banks literally played an important role to, uh, to, to, to add to the you know, required funding uh, to this national, the regular, the, the, uh, the governments in those countries. Uh, but can they continue to do that? Uh, maybe maybe they don't increase the interest rate for this particular quarter, but eventually they have to. Well, they're already behind the curve, though, right, in terms of inflation. Sure, yes. how, are they, how are they going to, to avoid this, this runaway inflation with what's happened? Forget about, I mean, two weeks ago, it was hard enough then. Right now, with the oil prices in such uncertainty, the trajectory that is, um, it's a it's a fascinating story. I, I don't know how they're go- they're going to be sitting there and making these decisions. I would not want to be uh, in their shoes. Well, at this see, point. nobody actually understands the clear scenario as of now. What, how much is the impact with the Russia and Ukraine? Uh, what is the magnitude of uh, the outcome of this? Uh, will it going to be overlap into the Europe or it just going to be stopped in a day's time? But nobody anticipated or expected that Ukraine is going to fight back so strong. So, right. Uh, they thought it's, you know, in, in hours or days, maybe they give up and uh, then the negotiating starts. Uh, but this is, you know, uh, it's not an economic scenario. It's about the emotional sentiments and the public belief that freedom and, and the national pride. So uh, how do you actually put that into an economic scenario or run a model here? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and, and eventually, how do we go to support, uh, especially the entire Europe is supporting and everybody is talking about how to provide those humanitarian grounds, the Red Cross, everybody is. Uh, so I think the dialogue is towards how to save the people in Ukraine. But at least now there's no pandemic, there's no the COVID, so at least one issue is not there, so it is about saving lives now. Yeah, and again, uh, to be very frank here, I, talking about the economy and the financial markets and so on and so forth at a time like this is is quite difficult when there's a human tragedy and, taking and place. And the Russian oligarchs and other the, the billionaires, their assets will be frozen, uh, their, their inflow of the cash is literally stopped, whether it's the U.S. or... So all those measures uh, is going to be impacting. So who's going to step up and fill the gap? Right. And that's where I want to um, uh, bring you again into into the federal... Uh, I mean, from away from the Federal Reserve to the fiscal policy part of it. But... Um, I have a request from Sandeep, um, so I'm just going to give him the mic. Um, Sandeep, go ahead. Can you take yeah, the you, mic? Yeah. yeah, the mic is yours, Sandeep. I just, I just authorized it here. Yep, I got the green light, Sandeep. It's yours. Hi. There you go. Hi. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm disturbing the conversation's flow. No, 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 uh, please. Yes. 
The more the uh, merrier. So I, I just had a small question regarding uh, the the gas supply chain. It's a very interesting one, and I was just trying to connect the dots. If uh, you know, way back in the 80s and the 90s, the gas interdependency was a big reason for, uh, you know, crisis not escalating beyond a certain level. But now a lot of that perhaps is changing. Uh, or, or do you see that uh, gas will perhaps not play as critical a role in, in peacemaking as it did earlier? Uh, that's my limited question. Thank you. Nagar, you want to take, you want to take that? Uh, it's it's a very you know uh, it's a very loaded question though. <laughs> uh, how do we actually um, measure that? Right? It, it, I think the, the the oil embargo in the U uh, the U S took place in the seventies, if I'm not wrong, <clears throat> the first time where. People are lined up uh, in the gas stations, and and there's a the, the, the chaos. That's what we saw in the news when we were kids, right? So uh, then in the 90s, 91, there's a Kuwait um, the war. Then that, that's where the gas price went up, uh, out of control. And in the in the early 2000, uh, again there was a gas price gas price hike where I have seen um, where the gas the the gallon of gas almost went out six to six seven dollars where most of the hummers was being crashed out in the california because then <clears throat> that's where the the toyota prius becomes the most uh, hot commodity or the property that every everybody wants to own it to showcase that they're environmental friendly kind of a thing uh, but today's scenario it may be going to getting worse uh, because the demand is very high and uh, uh, and and uh, because the COVID also, you know, the supply chain issues, um, I, I would say the, the the oil price will continues to raise, and that really impacts uh, the the overall economy globally, not just in the U.S. but also uh, the entire imports. And it, if anybody who stops the oil production, even the ten percent from the the Russia, that's what the U.S. administration today said. We just only import 10% from Russia, so that's why we are not stopping it. Uh, if that stops, and then where is the, how do you fill the gap? Then probably you have to increase the U.S. production. Uh, I mean, we're not going to use the word within the U.S., the sanctions within the U.S. companies by the U.S. administration. Um, so they need to lift that. Maybe the Keystone uh, oil, pipe, oil, the Keystone project has to be a jump start so that there's a, you know, from Canada to the U.S. There's the multiple ways uh, the administration can jump start uh, uh, to, to improve the economy in the U.S. Uh, to bring the consumer confidence. But um, I think uh, we are still in the early phases. Um, to make those kind of decisions, I, I believe. Yeah, and I wanted to add on to that, uh, Sandeep. You broke a little bit, so I didn't hear the entire question. But you were also asking about the longer-term implications, not the short-term yeah. only, because yeah. it's very interesting. Today, Elon Musk tweeted about, I saw it about an hour before our session started, and he said, you know, yeah. we should increase gas supplies, oil supplies. And, you know, the comments that he was getting, people couldn't believe it. This is a guy who's, you know, electric vehicle builder sure, saying yeah. that. And that's the short term reality of it. He's absolutely on to the point here. The prices are going to go up in the short term. This is a major disruption to the markets that we're already suffering from from supply chain issues like Nagarai said, demand issues. So this only exacerbated <clears throat> the situation. However, having said all that. I want to look at five to 10 years from now. I want to look at the new energy models that the U.S. has been working on, the European Union has been working on. Are those going to be affected by this disruption or are they going to continue in that it's trying to kind of um, push away oil and gas, gas's dominance uh, in the energy markets? And I think that's a great question that, um, that maybe we should talk about a little bit in the long term. What are we going to do in terms of our energy supply? And Sandeep, you're free to to also chime in here. Uh, we have a couple of um, 
panelists who couldn't join in because of uh, connection issues. So you are a panelist now. <laughs> it's very, it's very my fun. screen is up or? It, it, it blinked. Uh, you came and disappeared. And I want to welcome uh, Preeti Dubi as well. Uh, she just joined us. Uh, uh, Preeti, we're talking about just a quick summary, obviously, the new, new economic uh, growth model. Uh, but, you know, we had to mention what's happening, of course, in the Ukraine and how this economic growth model, uh, if at all, has, has been modified. And that we've been discussing for the past 30 some minutes. And everybody's in the agreement that it has dramatically been modified. So, um, Nagarash, if you want to comment on that long term energy um, demand supply situation, please do so. And pretty, it's very informal here. So if you want the mic, just let me know and I'll pass it on to you for your comments. Well, I, I continue the long term impact of the oil because we are still in the infancy stage about the alternate renewable source system, whether it's the wind energy or solar panels um, or any other form of other than uh, burning the fossil fuel, right? So uh, are we there in the next five years, even though we are expediting the ESG framework? I passionately talk about the ESG from the for, from the World Economic Forum point of view, whether it's the U.S. General Assembly, the 17 uh, Sustainable Development Goals point of view. So uh, the, the world is moving in, a, in a, the right direction, I would say, for, on the ESG front, uh, but without having an alternative uh, mechanism to switch on and off, uh, will it be viable? So, but especially the, the two classic issues, uh, classic concern that I have is uh, China never said they're going to follow the 2015 at zero. Uh, they said it is 2070, their moving target is. And India said there will be 2060. So, the rest of the world is moving towards net zero by 2050, both Europe and the US. But the world's largest uh, polluters uh, with a 3 billion population, both India and China, will not be there in your uh, target goal of 2050. So the rest of the world will be cleaning the, uh, the globe, whereas the other half of the world is messing up. Um, so, and that means they're actually burning more oil. Um, so maybe in the US and the Europe, we are trying to uh, enforce through the regulations, through the sanctions, uh, not to drill more oil uh, to save the planet, if that is an idea. But the rest of the world is burning faster those fossil fuels and importing more oil. Uh, so is it really the right strategy? Uh, in the US and the Euro, people are doing the right thing. They're being penalized because they, they're asked to pay more higher price for the gas. Uh, so it, it, I, I, it's again, it's a policy decision. Uh, in the long term, probably the way I look at it, if this continues to escalate, uh, then maybe the U.S. will administration will think about um, uh, lifting the sanctions in the U.S. And, uh, maybe go back to the last 12 months back. The U.S. was actually surplus in oil production, exporting oil, but now we are in importing oil. So that, that's the bottom line. Here. Yeah. And I want to, um, with 10 minutes left or so in the panel, I want to bring the fiscal policy uh, component of this uh, onto the table because again this this new economic growth model um, is the, the the talks about the policy uh, have divided country divided Europe between the haves and have nots right that um, with COVID especially with Federal Reserve's um, support to the financial markets there there is this huge gap between haves and they have not. And we're hearing all this argument, which is making more sense now than it did before COVID, um, that there has to be a shared prosper prosperity for the sustenance of long-term economic growth. And that shared prosperity, in my opinion at this point, cannot be done with monetary policy op officials or just with monetary policy alone. So as we look at this new economic growth model, uh, again, two weeks before, if we had this panel uh, before the invasion of, of the Ukraine, we would be talking about different elements of it, sure. But I want to bring this fiscal element onto the table. What is it that we need to do, the, the government status? Forget about monetary policy. 
forget about the central bank because we were talking before um, everybody joined that the only way is up for interest rates, whether we're going into recession or not. They cannot cut down interest rates. So we are um, kind of looking to fiscal policy to create that shared prosperity, quote unquote. How do we get there? What do you think? And it's open for everybody, really. I can I can try that <laughs> because the, the physical policy, if you're looking at it, is the government how they tax their own people and to run the government. And the second is the fiscal policy how to provide incentives to the private sectors to grow the business. Um, so it's it's a two aspect. So it's a it's a public and private partnership. Uh, it is working good in the U.S., maybe in the Europe, but if you look at a third world country, maybe it's a bigger challenge. Um, it, especially two examples. In the U.S., there are more number of taxpayers. So the government generates the huge IRS generates the huge tax collections and uh, the government uh, invests on R&D, especially classic is how they wanted to give like uh, uh, free electric vehicles, EV subsidiary charging stations uh, to provide uh, so that the General Motors or Ford, all these car manufacturing companies can exploit their uh, manufacture, the innovation to the EV, uh, not into the economies as of now, but the electric vehicles so that they can easily chargeable, uh, providing a free service. So, uh, the government can can expedite that kind of uh, innovation or spend that kind of money because they collected the, the taxes through um, to through through their 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 population. But if you look at the India, probably one percent of the population pay the taxes, even though it's one point one thirty uh, hundred thirty million population. But how many people actually pay? Is the, the tax rate and the population, how much tax is very less. Uh, Europe, maybe it's different. So that's what, so every country has their own fiscal policy measures to increase their tax savings. But at the same time, how much is that translated into providing those uh, research and development for innovation to the public sector? And um, that's, that's, what, that's, the, that's the, the, the part that I want to follow up with because Again, we were talking about it in the beginning, um, the European model of this this really awkward obsession with solid numbers that to keep the fiscal deficit, right, to, to a certain level of GDP. And they were doing that when they were in recession. Yes. I, mean, I, I don't know if anything positive came out of COVID in terms of economic policy. Finally, they realized, well, these numbers actually need to be relaxed. Um what, what do we do with that? Because there's going to be some spending too, right? Yes, taxes are possible. Infrastructure spending. I mean, look how divided we're in this country. We cannot get a simple package in. And that's good for America, right? And it's good for Europe when they do this. What do we need to do to get that done? Because without that, I don't think we are going to be able to avoid the stagflation in this country and also in Europe as well. I, maybe I'm alone in this in this thinking, but... Uh, I'm I'm quite worried about this. The fiscal policy needs to be more active, or assume a more active role, and uh, the policymakers need to understand that from both sides of the aisle. Well, in the U.S. administration point of what we have seen the last few months, there's a there's a uh, there's no concise. Uh, definitely, there's, there's always. I mean, there's a the multiple failures in the in the laws that the, the current administration uh, I mean, is trying to pass. Uh, but they're not able to, you know, because of the, the, the thin majority that they have in both Congress and uh, in the Senate, uh, they're not able to justify uh, some of the good measures. Maybe it's not acceptable to the, the opposition parties. So uh, unless you, as you rightly pointed, unless the government spend, whether it's the Build Back Better or uh, the, the $1.9 trillion stimulus, uh, continuous the stimulus checks or the student, uh, uh, the, the loan waiver point of a few, few billions. So there's the multiple measures that the uh, administration would like to pass on, or the previous administration. There's a huge stress on the, the balance sheet from the Fed point of view, I believe, uh, that that is challenging for the administration because you already have uh, a deficit or almost a 20 trillion in the U.S. economy. 
so the, the deficit is so high that you cannot continue to be increasing the deficit uh, for providing incentives or, or benefits to the public um, for longer periods. All right. Yeah. Um, and we're wrapping up here. I'm looking at the time and I'm getting all these signals from the platform. They're it's very adamant about time. Uh, you, you know that it's Frank's baby because Frank will always remind you, you you know, keep the time to the limit. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to ask you, uh, first of all, I'd like to declare Sandeep a fellow panelist today. <laughs> Thank you very much. With our two panelists not being able to connect due to connection issues. Uh, we have Conrad joining in at the tail end. Uh, I don't know if Conrad, you'd like to make any comments. We talked issues from Ukraine uh, invasion to uh, Conrad has left. So <laughs> we don't need to worry about that. Any well, last Sunday, words though? Sunday we'll have a last word on that. Yeah, I, yeah. Sunday, yes, please. I, ha- I had a question in fact, but for both of you, if I may just say, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting again. And that's about no. uh, taking the liberty of the title of the panel. And I want to ask about modern monetary theory. Uh, where do you see that coming in, in a stage uh, where we are trying to balance a fiscal deficit? And if you, if you want to touch upon that. I just wanted to make a very brief comment on it. We, we've actually studied at Barry, uh, my company, at those risk analysis. And uh, there are, in, in our findings, there are situations where modern economic theory can be injected into the economy and uh, have monetary policy give that role that we've been talking about, right? They're running out this role now uh, with interest rates so low. However, given the situation like this, where we're seeing possible runaway inflation, possible supply, not possible anymore, I'm sorry, supply chain disruption, serious supply chain disruption, all kinds of structural problems. Uh, I'm not sure if, if this is going to be an answer to, uh, to the new growth model, but I, I appreciate the question. And Nagaraj, I want to give you uh, some time to answer this too, because this is something that I wanted to talk about in this panel a little longer. Yeah, same when I look at the U.S. deficit as of today, it's almost touching 20 trillion, and that as almost as equivalent to as the annual GDP of the U.S. So that means you're literally writing off the deficit into one year of your GDP. Uh, a few years back, it was two trillion or three trillion. People, you know, the economists literally. Uh, make a huge uh, outcry because the U.S. never used to be like this. We always used to be the surplus. Uh, but having the deficit almost uh, $20 trillion, how much the modern economic policy continues to talk about uh, providing incentives to the, their, their, their population? For example, um, the COVID is a classic example where Every U.S., uh, the people who are unemployed was given, uh, I would say, free checks or checks mailed to them uh, for almost 18 months, let's say, uh, or a family of two. Uh, now the situation, the government actually making them giving more money rather than what they actually earn during their employment. <clears throat> Um, they're actually, if, if a family of two with the two kids, they were making almost $5,600 plus. Uh, so what is an incentive that one has to go out and work to earn? Uh, rather, the government is providing free incentives saying that uh, we will continue to provide these, these economic benefits. Uh, but how long the government is going to sustain that? Where do they going to generate? Uh, through the taxes, so the, go- the, the administration is saying that over and above, if you're earning four hundred thousand dollars, we're going to increase your taxes. Uh, we have seen the New York and, and California where, where the companies and the people are migrating to different states because the taxes are high, uh, and it, it's very unfortunate because uh, the the you are penalizing to the, the consumers who are paying taxes. And you're trying to squeeze more to them because they're law-abiding citizens paying taxes. Then you're asking them, no, no, not 40%, you have to pay 45%. And you're giving that money to, to the people who are not working at all, just staying at home. Uh, but, you know, it, it, you, we can talk about different ways how you do that because of the pandemic. But 
uh, will the government continues to provide that kind of incentive based policies that impacts and increases your deficit for long term uh, where it is it is not controllable yeah and i i i want to say that too I, whether this it's a completely different panel discussion i think whether sure. this needed was needed uh, to be done or not and i'm on the side that it needed to be done nagarash because sure. of the economic difficulties but when it needed to stop and i think the point that you are making and uh, which which is what i what i try to convey as well to sandeep with, with this great question about uh, new monetary theory is that we're not there to start this new monetary theory because of this fiscal deficit that has uh, ballooned immensely uh, because of COVID as well. But it's an idea, I think, that needs more research. And I think it's an idea that can work in the right economic fundamentals. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I'd like to I'd love to explore that uh, in the future because that not discussing that i think would do injustice to the new economic growth model and policies that that are being discussed with that said um i would like to thank everyone <laughs> people who came in and left and uh sandeep thank you so much for joining us nagaraj you were awesome uh it was a pleasure to talk to you two weeks ago and you just you know carried the football today uh literally i appreciate it very much And uh, hope to see everybody uh, in a future gathering, this time in person, not like this. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> All right, take care, everybody. Have a great night. You too, great. Thanks, Thanks, Andrew. Thanks. Thank you, Navaraj. Yeah. Thanks.